Welcome to the Centralized News, weekly coverage of everything Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, and the surrounding markets. This is not financial advice. Please do your own research. I'm My name is Piter. I'm joined as always by my good friend Ozzy up in the Canadian North. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. We've got nice sun today. Can't complain. It's cold out here, like straight 57 degrees. <laughs> you call that cold. <laughs> <laughs> the wind was blowing. It's wind chill. It's intense, bro. <laughs> anyway, the market is hot this morning. Bitcoin at 54, pushing 55. I'm looking at it right now. What are we at? 50. Oh, no, it came back down a little bit. It was like the 54.6. We're down to 54.3. But anyway, it's hot. Quickly, we got a couple of political stories today involving Ted Cruz, Elizabeth Warren, and newcomer John Deaton. Get into that a little bit. We have a new company that has verified crypto holdings, and it says a lot about regulation for Ethereum, so we'll talk about that. AI coins are showing some strength as a contender for the dominant narrative this bull run. Get into that a little bit. Macro update, and we'll finish off with a bunch of news and notes from the altcoin universe. So we'll kick it off today with Senator Ted Cruz. He is setting the stage for make, making the debut of a digital dollar an issue for the 2024 presidential election. So let's talk about why. Sorry, Texas, Texas Republican Senator Ted Cruz. He's a ranking member of the Senate Commerce Committee, along with four other Senate Republicans. So this is a GOP effort. will sponsor a new bill called the Central Bank Digital Currency Anti-Surveillance State Act. A lot of words there. Okay. So basically <laughs> what it's saying is that the Federal Reserve lacks the authority to issue a CBDC and that any digital dollar needs authorization from Congress. They got to come to Congress first and pass a law. That's a, just on, on let, let's own. just talk about the really bad acronym for this act. The CBDC <laughs> ASS Act. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah. Someone might want to think about their act, like the different words in what that name. Is yeah. Oh God. That I was just. CBC is a jack ass. Yeah. Interesting. Maybe that's the message they were trying to send. But I was like, I didn't even notice that. Man. Oh, I was just. So, Go ahead. <laughs> so, so, so why is this a presidential campaign issue? So the Biden administration has sanctioned the Fed to conduct extensive research into the issue of CBDC. And while the Fed has made no decision on pursuing the implementation of a CBDC, they, they, haven't, they haven't specifically said the expectation is that any CBDC legislation will likely be shut down if Biden remains in office, that they're generally pro-CBDC. Now, Trump is on record saying in January that he would never allow the creation of a CBDC, an independent White House hopeful, Robert F. Kennedy, has called CBDCs a calamity for human rights and for civil rights in a January 24th interview. So there seems to be a clear divide between the presidential candidates on what's going to happen with CBD and how legislation in the future is either supported or not supported. Yeah, there's a pretty clear divide in the U.S. right now in terms of just the presidential candidates of who, who wants a CBDC, who doesn't, and how this all impacts the future. And this isn't the first time that we've seen Ted Cruz and other GOP candidates and senators talk and press an anti-CBDC bill. We'll see how things flip. I think one big danger of leaving this in the, the House of the Senate or of Congress is that if it flips either fully so that it's a majority Democrat, then you could have your CBDC anyways, even with the passing of this act. Something to keep in mind there. But they're definitely making that message. I think they, they're they seeing it as a strong issue that they, might, that they might have strong favor in, at least with the Republicans as they're pushing this bill. I know that for most libertarians and most crypto people this this would be a very welcome bill interesting to see where it'll go and whether when this gets to the floor if it gets to the floor and it's true that the gop in general seems to be rallying around crypto a little bit and this can also be seen in the state of massachusetts which there was a big announcement earlier this week we have a contender possibly for lizzie warren exciting seems like a bit of a long shot right now but you never know it's a long way to go but crypto lawyer john deaton 
announced his run for Senate in Massachusetts. This was rumored a couple of weeks ago, but it's official. So last Tuesday, the day we launched our last video. So he has been a proponent for crypto and is behind a website called Crypto Law, which regularly posts about crypto legal and regulatory developments. So involved in that end. He is a lawyer and a former Marine. Uh, Deaton has frequently criticized Senator Warren and SEC Chair Gary Gensler for their handling of the industry. He was involved in uh, the lawsuit in 2021, challenging the SEC's claim on XRP as security. And like I said, as a former Marine and a lawyer, he is considered a serious candidate. Uh, but he does first have to win the Republican nomination against four challengers. So there's a primary. I have not seen any kind of polling data or anything like that. I don't know much about the other contenders because... As much as I am interested in politics, uh, that gets a little deep. I'm not out in Massachusetts, but the fact that he's pro-crypto, he came on my radar. Uh, Senator Warren is seeking her fourth term as a U.S. senator, and she sits on the Senate Finance and Banking Committees. She has been a she has been critical of crypto and has recently been pushing her anti-money laundering bill. And it's an extension of the Bank Secrecy Act requirements, including know your customer rules for miners, validators, and wallet providers. And some people criticize it as just untenable. Massachusetts, yeah. I just want to point this out real quickly because people assume Massachusetts is, is Democrat. So Massachusetts currently has two Democratic senators and a Democratic governor. But I just want to point out that Scott Brown was the former senator and he was a Republican. That's who Elizabeth Warren beat. So it's not completely out of the question to have a Republican. Especially when you've got Elizabeth Warren being criticized probably from two or three different sides. Massachusetts is considered a little bit more of a, a crypto open uh, state. I, I would say I, I don't, it's hard to say with like with all of the states, but there there's a lot of interest in crypto and, and that kind of tech in Massachusetts, especially Boston is a semi a bit of a hub in terms of crypto development in the US. And so it would be interesting to see if John Deaton and his popular crypto stance will help him and maybe bring a Republican candidate, uh, a senator to Massachusetts. The other kind of interesting thing is that from the campaign ads that we've seen so far, he's not pushing his crypto stance. And we were talking before the show and said from both of our political experiences, that's probably a smart idea because if he can win enough candidates votes on everything, not crypto related, most people that know crypto know John Deaton. We're both familiar with his name. I've definitely read some of his stuff when we've talked about previous lawsuits and cases going on in cryptos he's pretty well known there if, if we were voting in massachusetts he already got has our vote there's no need to convince us right yeah exactly if, if you're pro crypto in massachusetts you probably know who he is and he doesn't need to convince you but uh, got to convince the rest of massachusetts so will be interesting could be i i would say if he wins in massachusetts that could be one of the most bullish things for crypto in in 2024, 2025, just because it would take away probably the biggest opponent to crypto in the, the U.S. Senate and, and even in Congress, really, and put someone that's pro-crypto and very knowledgeable about crypto in, in that powerful seat. Pretty interesting yeah, to be, see. Just her being threatened by it may be a shot across the bow for anyone who's planning to come out real strong against crypto. If that's one of the reasons why it's seen that she is having trouble as an incumbent keeping her seat. Yeah. Even if it becomes a race, it could help even in, in this election cycle. It's like, oh, she's having trouble. An incumbent, I don't know if she's popular. I'm really not sure, but it could be a warning for other people to get too heavy anti-crypto. Like that's not a, necessarily a winning, winning tactic. Absolutely. What does seem to be a winning tactic, at least for Ethereum, is the fact that Reddit has come out this week and said that they hold some crypto in their treasury. They've submitted an S1 registration statement, which is related to their planned IPO. In that document, they've said that some of their cash reserves are invested in Bitcoin and ETH for treasury purposes. And then they also note that they have ETH and Matic for the payment and of for sales of certain virtual goods so they're also holding some matic so pretty interesting some interesting picks especially eth because when we look at eth 
there was a risk-based determination as part of the S-1 filing, which is a really strongly vetted document that says it's likely not a security. And that is pretty interesting with Reddit joining KPMG Canada and Meitu as one of the few companies that currently hold ETH on their balance sheets. There's a good number of companies that hold Bitcoin on their balance sheets like MicroStrategy, but not very many that hold both Bitcoin and ETH. So pretty interesting. There is one caveat to that statement about the S1 in terms of they they did state that although they aren't the risk-based judgments and they don't constitute a legal standard. So it's essentially saying they aren't making a court ruling on this. This isn't the SEC's official opinion, but based on their risk-based assessment for their S, the S1 filing, there's enough risks there or absence of risks that they don't consider it a security. So that's pretty interesting for Reddit and for ETH. Maybe part of the reason why we're seeing ETH at 3,100 right now, 3,200 almost. Yeah, the narrative around ETH is pretty strong. We do have the ETF and what's going to happen with that. What's going to happen on the regulatory end with ETH? We don't know. It's a little bit of a mystery. But this is a significant, serious opinion about ETH. Like you said, very interesting to see. And as more and more... The expectation is more and more companies are going to start holding some type of crypto, but the expectation also is that they'll take a micro strategies approach where they'll hold Bitcoin only. So seeing Reddit jump in with ETH, like I said, significant, serious, exciting for Ethereum holders, I think. Absolutely exciting for Ethereum holders. And even the fact that Matic is mentioned at all as because they really only mentioned Bitcoin, ETH and Matic in the filing, definitely probably got some Matic holders excited and even though reddit does mention that they are additional virtual currencies that their engineering teams hold in small samples for different testing so maybe that list grows maybe maybe we see more things on their balance sheet moving forward that being said it would be awesome to add some more subscribers to our balance sheet so please yeah, consider a lo- growing list right speaking of a growing list please do like and subscribe <laughs> yeah it would really help us out it helps the algorithm helps us out i think make it, it helps everyone find the real information in the space and not fall prey to all of those influencers posting things that they don't really understand or believe or necessarily have full information on so yeah, come get the, the straight a news. Of guys, you're listening to a couple of guys that have taken not one penny from any project or anything like that we're just bringing you the news as we see it we certainly have our own little personal biases that probably come through once in a while but we're just trying to deliver the news in a decentralized fashion absolutely one thing that is maybe not so decentralized right now is how much nvidia is driving up crypto AI tokens right now, their strong earnings in the last week on Wednesday basically saw a lot of AI tokens like Render, Fetch AI, Singularity Net all record some pretty strong gains after seeing revenues jump from 5 point to 5.16 per share. So that's a pretty strong jump and definitely not something to miss out on. Yeah, it's definitely got me thinking about, there's a list of probably 20 different narratives, deep in gaming, AI, real world. What narrative is going to be the dominant one in this bull market? And then you have people like the NVIDIA CEO kind of pivoting from cryptocurrency into their computer chips or for AI. You have People like SEC Chair Gary Gensler are saying the most important technological advancement that's come along since the internet or since electricity, however you want to describe it, is AI. So imagining AI as the dominant narrative is not that hard to do. And it's got me thinking, oh, what are some projects that you can get in on early? Like we mentioned FET, Singularity, Render. Those have pumped already. Now they may have plenty of room to grow. And by all means, this is not financial advice, and please do your own research. But recently I found a list of 30 
different projects that still haven't launched yet. And here are some random ones, but, and if you're interested, this is kind of stuff that we post on our Twitter account. So we'll put the links if you want to follow us on Twitter. We get a little bit more deeper down the rabbit hole with some, in terms of sharing some of these company names. But I'll list a couple of them just randomly. There's Ritual Net, there's Dane Protocol, there's modular labs, and these have to do with ZK rollups, data, AI agents, whether they're GPU based. Yeah, if you're interested, please do give us a follow. It's definitely something I am starting to do more research on. These are all completely unvetted projects. These are just things that I'm going to be looking into. Yeah, there's been a couple of things that I, I've been looking into. I, With this huge surge in, in ETH and in AI, I've... I picked up a token called Via on their launch, which is big on AI and was recommended to by someone in our Discord community. And I did a little bit of my own research and I liked it. And so I did pick some up. I'm up a little bit, probably 30%, 35%, something like that. But still a lot of room to grow there probably, at least in my opinion, but not financial advice. But definitely go check out the community. Kind of fun. These are fun projects to literally gamble on or to play around with in terms of research and stuff like that. Exciting. But anyway, yeah, not financial advice. We're not financial advisors. Just sharing our experiences with you guys. Yeah. That being said, we'll also share some of our experience on the macro. We've been looking at the macro for basically forever on this show. And one thing that we have talked about a little bit, but we haven't talked a ton about is the Dixie. The Dixie is the dollar index and you might think the dollar index like what is that but it talks about the strength of the dollar relative to other currencies and if you'll see on the chart on screen generally when the dixie is strong bitcoin performs poorly when the dixie is weakening bitcoin tends to do well right now Essentially, for this entire surge, if we look at the last year and a half, coin has gone up because the Dixie's been weakening. And you can see where periods where Bitcoin was trading sideways or dipping a little bit, where there was some kind of relief rallies in the Dixie. Something interesting to watch. One thing that affects the Dixie a lot is interest rates. And yeah, this big pump in the Dixie was when they were raising rates quickly. And they're really rapidly raising rates. That's when Bitcoin had its worst time. Yeah. And and so one thing that people like, if you're, you like the Dixie or study the Dixie or a correlation at least that you can make is the fact that the Dixie's weakening and, and lowering is helping fuel the dollar and f- fueling Bitcoin really, because essentially the purchasing power of that dollar is going down. And so you need the price of Bitcoin essentially has to go up for the purchasing power essentially equivalent to remain the same even so you can kind of see it in other charts where they're in other countries where inflation is even hotter that we were starting to see all-time highs in bitcoin already so that's another way to look at it but yeah generally speaking a stronger dixie is like a headwind and a weakening dixie is like a tailwind for bitcoin can can be seen as that potentially and it's at an, an an interesting level it's been above this level only since they started raising interest rates and we're starting to talk about if and when they're going to pivot the expectation is they're going to pivot so we could continue to see pressure down on the dixie yeah probably not at this next meeting which is 23 days away when we look look at a potential fed pivot we're at a nine almost 98 percent chance of no change at the next meeting in march so probably not the next meeting we're in May now, we're at 85% chance of no change. And we're looking, it's only now in June that we're seeing a 60% chance of a pivot starting in June. So could we see the Dixie break that major level? Maybe. Could the Dixie rally and or stay at this support and maybe get Bitcoin stuck a little bit? Who knows? Something definitely interesting to watch as we, we watch the... Fed and their interest rate hikes. The- yeah, besides besides the interest rate, we're about 23 days away from their next meeting. We also have a lot of data coming out this week. There's housing, both new and pending homes. Actually, the new home sales came out and it was lower than expectations. We also have pending home sales coming out. 
we get some GDP numbers. There's going to be a revision of the quarter four GDP growth rates. We have PCE inflation data. Also, a bunch of unemployment numbers coming out this week and next week. A lot could change over the next couple of weeks. Yeah. Especially yeah, especially with PCE. If PCE does anything remotely close to what CPI did, we could be looking at the Fed talking about another rate hike rather than right. a rate cut. Definitely something to watch there. That would be a turn of events. That would be a major turn of events and... Everyone always talks about a double bottom on Bitcoin pre-having, and we haven't had that yet. Could that be fueled to our... What, the, what is a potential narrative that could drive it? And this this might be one. Th this could be one. I'm not saying we're going to double bottom. All, all cycles... It's hard to imagine today with the way it's... Exactly. All cycles rhyme, but they're never the, they're never the same. And we don't necessarily double bottom, but this could be a narrative that could cause a double bottom if inflation remains transient and doesn't doesn't disappear. It stays at that large level. That being said, please consider liking and subscribing. We're really appreciative of everybody's support, and we hope that you enjoy everything that we put out. Please let us know. Do you think Bitcoin double bottoms, or do you think we see a new all-time high pre-having? Let us know in the comments. Let's get into some of the altcoin stuff. Uniswap was probably the big newsmaker in the altcoin market. And just this whole idea of a governance token or a revenue sharing token. It seems like there's a whole new conversation going on in the altcoin market now. Oh, absolutely. Uh, Uniswap has activated revenue sharing as part of their new proposal. Well, proposal, I believe, like they're proposing it, but it's expected to pass. Is that what happened or is it? Already I'm, I, I'm relatively sure it's already passed. Yeah. And that caused a huge surge in uni price and Uniswap price. DEX tokens especially were known as one that don't generally do well. They do well in their first cycle and they don't do great afterwards. And generally because of inflation is one of those things that that's been talked about. But I, now that Uni is now not only a governance token, but also a with a rev share, you there's a whole new reason to be holding Uniswap as essentially a passive income play and a way to earn revenue from one of the biggest de the biggest decks in all of crypto right now. Yeah, and is it going to change how all these other projects go about it? We even have. Frack Suite about enable revenue sharing. And they also announced a big airdrop. This is a separate news story, but it's going to be the big MC. Frax Finance announced that FXTL airdrop snapshot for FS, FXS stakers. And it'll be taken on March 6th. So this airdrop expected to be the biggest airdrop for FXS holders to ever occur. And then they also had this tweet about revenue sharing. So Frax in the news. Yeah. The other ones that we've seen as potential big players moving into the rev share space, at least rumored right now, are Lido, which makes would make sense as a decentralized staking provider. Why not, if they're making money on fees, why not go back to those stakers and to those Lido holders? Make or dab. I heard, I heard Rollbit too, which is a gambling app. Yeah, and they've done, they're doing over 30 million in revenue per quarter and then maker who owns die the the die stable coin also rumored to be a good candidate looking at you you scoffed off you laughed off metamask doing that I, I i laughed off metamask more in terms of a they i think it would go back to linea we'll talk about linea a little bit now skipping ahead they've just done a big upgrade they're rumored to have a big airdrop soon when no one exactly knows but soon and they had a huge huge upgrade that helped slash finalization costs and could be essentially the metamask airdrop that everyone's been looking for they're built by the same company consensus so maybe that's where we start seeing that rev share uh, linea supporting everything on the metamask side just because having it tied to a wallet might not make as much sense. 
That being said, we're seeing L2s everywhere. Bl uh, Blur and their Blast L2 launch is expected next week. Blur stakers are expected to get a large percentage of the Blast airdrop. Pendle is seeing skyrocketing TVL for because people are trading points related to different airdrops, especially Egan Layer, but other airdrops as well. XAI has announced that their staking is going live next week. They are a new L Arbitrum L3 for gaming, so definitely something that's interesting. Their, their name's XAI, and they're an L3 for gaming, so definitely feels like a, a massive narrative play. Yeah, um, they're doing like a node sale too eventually. I was looking into them a little bit. Interesting group and new on Arbitrum. It's always fun to get in early, but yeah, NFA, just researching. Looking at other airdrops, we've got Starknet is confirming that there's going to be a second airdrop with a $40 million Starknet ecosystem incentive program, which is worth about $70 million current prices for Stark. So something to watch there. And KelpDAO has introduced their new, their token KELP, which is supposed to represent Egan Lair points. Interesting. We've talked about Egan Lair and they're uh, big in the news with the restaking narrative Gearbox, which has introduced an Egan Lair restaking leverage program. They, where users can earn up to nine and a half times their Egan points and 19 times the ether five points on Gearbox by using leverage. You've talked to me and told me in private about how you definitely feel like this could be our big collapse. Every cycle tends to have a big collapse, a house of cards that everyone thinks is a great idea at the start. And then you're talking about restaking in general, just like yeah. the concept. Yeah. yeah. Ju just the concept. Cause uh, you start to remember the APY wars we had back in the day. Yeah. Oh, I remember the API. Yeah, was, and now you see like 9.5 leverage. Yeah, it definitely yeah. makes me curious. Especially because of the whole ecosystem that's building up around restaking. We've got Prisma Finance, which has released Prisma LRT, which is a new bro borrowing protocol that supports the liquid restake tokens as collateral. So EETH or other restaked ETH alternatives being able to be borrowed against so you're talking about leverage lending and borrowing you're talking about one of these things depegging and you could have a massive ecosystem around it collapse i don't share your same concerns about restaking natively restaking is something if you're doing it straight on egan layer don't have a huge issue i'll probably put a video out about it this week but all of the things that are coming up around it is starting to worry me and shows me a little bit of a house of cards building up. Yeah, just be careful who you give your ETH to. Because, like, it just adds another layer of risk, right? So then just to buy ETH, you have to trust ETH, right? And then you're trusting another layer on top of that, like Egan layer. And then you're talking about layers on top of that. It's like, how many people are you willing to trust with your ETH? Ask yourself that question. Yeah, Optimism also trusts ETH, and they've unveiled that they are doing a fourth airdrop that's all for NFT artists with 560 million Optimism tokens that are still left to be allocated to future airdrops. So massive airdrop there. And they've also done a, a massive upgrade with the introduction of span batches on mainnet which yeah, should this help be exciting sounding to me like this one seemed like big news oh it's massive and maybe part of linea's upgrade i think linea maybe is built on the op stack at least it would explain the same numbers going around of a 90 percent cut because that's reduces the fees that they're having to pay massively and makes could make running l2s just a hundreds of times cheaper like mm. to think about it, if you've managed to cut fees by 90%, yeah. what it used to cost you to run the chain for a month is now what it costs you essentially to run it for a year or almost yeah. a year. That's in terms pretty of development. It would seem to help a lot with being able to develop something and not having all this overhead in terms of its potential for the future. It seems like it very much help with the development of the chain. Yeah. And then I guess 
one last big thing other than the mode network also int introducing their layer three, which is being powered by Optimism and Celestia, is Ethereum partnering with a whole bunch of these L as part of a ZK pool. They partnered with Aztec, Polygon, Scroll. Check out my airdrop guide for Scroll that I put out last week. Tyco and ZK Sync, several airdrop opportunities there. They all contributed 150000 to a shared prize pool totaling just shy of a million dollars to for the development of ZK technology. So apply before March 18th and potentially be able to help develop the next layer of ZK technology. For our devs out there. Yeah, that's that kind of wraps it up our, for our news and notes this week. Thank, thank you, everybody, for watching today's episode and listening and don't forget to share your opinions down in the comments please remember everything that we say is not financial advice please really do your own research we're just two guys having great conversations about crypto and sharing some of our opinions about it it's all for educational and entertainment purposes only like subscribe drop your comments let us know what do you think about restaking uh really anything maybe let us know what AI tokens you're checking out right now. We would love to, to hear about them. And uh, yeah, Give us some alpha. Yeah, we, we'd love to hear your alpha. So we'll see you all next time. And thanks for watching Decentralized News.